Proverbs 31, take your Bible, turn there. And when you get there, be prepared to stand and offer testimony concerning the woman that brought you into this world, the woman that raised you, the woman that taught you what you needed to know. Be ready to stand and offer testimony in God's house this morning, if you would. <clears throat> when I was praying and Lisa and I were driving yesterday, I asked her, I said, what do you, what do you think I ought to preach for Mother's Day? She said, I don't know. So I think I'm going to title this message, I don't know. No, I have a different title for this. And I'm just going to preach. I told you to turn to the book of Proverbs. I'm going to preach the book of Proverbs. Not every verse, not every chapter, but certain portions in it. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to let the Word of God say what the Word of God says to you this morning. I'm going to let God do the preaching. And um, the world has it wrong. I'll say this, the world's got it wrong. The feminist culture, the, the Me Too generation, the women's liberation movement from years gone by has brought about some very, very... Just think of it this way. The women's liberation movement has given us Joy Behar and Whoopi Goldberg as the mouthpiece for the 21st century woman. Now, ladies, is that your mouth? Do they speak for you? I didn't think so. Because if I would have heard it, yeah, 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 I think I'd go change my message right now. But somebody here this morning, let's, let me, let's read this. Proverbs 31, starting in verse 10. Let's read this. We'll have a word of prayer, and then I'm just going to let the Holy Ghost lay it upon somebody's heart who would like to stand and offer testimony of how God blessed them through their mother. Proverbs 31.10, the Bible says, who can find a virtuous woman. Now, I passed a, a church sign on the way over here this morning, and you know, I, 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 I don't like very many church signs anyway, because they're all for, so, full of goofy sayings. This one actually attempted to put a Bible verse on the board, but it was so out of whack, it just, it just made me angry. It was trying to quote Proverbs 31, 10, and, and I knew it wasn't a King James, because it said, who can find a woman of noble character? Now you can have a noble character, but not be a virtuous woman. This Bible is right. It is looking and God is the one who makes women virtuous. He gives them purity and cleanliness and holiness in their life. He's the one that changes Women's hearts, when no other man in the world can change a woman's heart. Amen. Men. Amen, Amen. men. God can change a woman when there ain't a man in the world can change a woman. God can do it. Amen. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. That's absolutely true in my life so that he shall have no need of spoil she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands she is like the merchant ship she bringeth forth her food from afar I'm amazed at my wife when I take her shopping every Friday and just when she's going to buy just a can of 
vegetables. She'll pick the can up and read it. And look at it and study it. Turn it around. Me, she sends me after a can of green beans. I go, green beans, done, check. So that's what that means. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night. That reminds me of Meemaw, Mama. Meemaw would be up cooking bacon while the rest of us is still laying down in our beds. Riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hand she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor. Listen to this. This is when, in a day when our grandparents didn't have three, four hundred dollars to shell out for a new dress. That didn't matter to them. They were clothed with strength and with honor. Somebody say amen. And she shall rejoice in time to come. She opened her mouth with wisdom. And in her tongue is the law of kindness. I can't begin to tell you the number of times that both my mother and my wife opened their mouth and said things that I was absolutely dumbfounded with because of the wisdom that came from both of them. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful. And beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. In fact, I want to do this right now. Everybody. Let's give a hand to all of our mothers in this place this morning. Give them a hand. She shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Father, again, we come before you today and I thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day to celebrate all these beautiful women. A beauty, Father, that goes way deeper than the skin. It's a beauty in their heart. Everything that they do, they seek to do right. To do their best. To give of their all. To save up and to store up when times are plenteous. So that her children have plenty when times are not plenteous. Father, may our church be modeled forever after the example of the women of this church. God, you've given men the responsibility of leadership. 
both in our houses and in our church. But Father, you've laid it upon the hearts of women to give the blessing of character and mercy and compassion not only in our homes but in our church as well. Father, I pray that you would bless this service and pray, dear God, Lord, that to each and every one they would model their lives after these great women in the Bible at Jerusalem above in heaven herself which the Bible says is the mother of us all. I pray, Father, that the spirit of heavenly Jerusalem with its beautiful gates and its houses full of joy would be manifested in this church and in our families, Lord, because of our mothers, our wives, our daughters who are now mothers, and their daughters after them. Father, bless this service, we pray in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Anybody wants to start first, just stand and offer. I, she beat you to ladies first, Gary. Go ahead, Megan. Amen. 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 I'm not getting on her bad side. I know that. That's good. had a great grandmother godly woman God promised her she always told us God promised her she would live to be a hundred years old she lived to be a hundred and one she raised how many kids mom 13 children three of them girls 10 boys Ladies, how'd you like to have that one? <laughs> Ten Charlies, Cheryl. No. no. One's enough, huh? Godly woman. Praise the Lord. Somebody else. Yes.
Yeah. And she started telling me all the things, you know, and realizing that what she said was what we said, what she went through before my dad was saved. And it just took a hold throughout the time on what parents are. And I just thank her every day, and I miss her every day. Amen. Amen. And uh, I will never forget the love that she pounded in us day in and day out. And what she gave up for her children. Amen. Your mother loved this church. Yes, she did. And I know that she would be tickled to death to know that you're still here in her place. Amen. Anybody else? Yes, Alicia. Um, I've been super, super blessed to grow up in this church with a lot of moms. A lot of people who I've been here with as moms. I've been very grateful for the moms. Amen. And uh, she, had, she had a hard life, but she never gave up. Yep. Amen. How about some of you boys? Some of you men want to cry and stand up. Go ahead, David. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? When I look at where this church is now, Compared to when we first started coming here, it's a small congregation. They just was putting the finishing touches on this building when we started here. The dedication service that we had that Sunday basically was a prayer meeting and, and the members of the church at that time we're setting aside this church, this building, for the preaching of the gospel, for the teaching, the admonishing, the correcting, and the training of God's saints. And they had hopes that God would bless this church, use it for His glory, His honor, His will, that folks would be saved, lives would be added to the kingdom of God, and so on. I don't think any of them could have seen or foreseen the way that God was going to
take this church in years to come. I can say that because of what God has done, we now have families literally all over the world. I spoke to a family in the Netherlands earlier this week. Counseled with them a little bit on some things going on in their life. I talk to people all the time, usually every week. They either call, they'll email. Sometimes I'll be someplace and they'll, uh, like this last weekend we were in uh, Wichita, Kansas. Some people came up to us and said, we follow your ministry. We were in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. People came to us up there and said, we follow you and we thank God for you and Everything that God has done there, we just have people literally all over the country. You have them in Canada. They're in the Philippines. They are, some of them are in places where it's almost illegal to be a Christian. The ministry that we have in Kenya right now, um, I'm not telling you much. Michael won't let me. That's why I'm mad at him. But he won't. He won't let me tell anybody what's going on. I, I will, He probably won't want me to say this. But I'm going to say that what God is doing with our church in Kenya, I'm going to use the word historic. And I'm not exaggerating. All of that is the result first of Miss Judy Hoggard back there, who God dealt with her. She came to one of these benches, gave her life to the Lord, loved the pastor, loved the pastor's wife, and immediately got her children in Sunday school made them sit during church and not talk made them listen to the preaching instead of reading the Guinness Book of World Records dad had brought me one from work he got me a Guinness Book of World Record she found out I brought it to church one Sunday and she said if I catch you reading that during church I'm going to whip you with it so she caught me. So when we got home, she got that book. It was a paper-bound book. She got it, and she went wham like that on my backside. No, it didn't hurt. But I wasn't going to let her know that. That was to keep her from getting my belt afterwards. She's the one that Prayed that her son would be used by God, 16 years old. Announced the call to preach here in this church. 1982. Met my wife here. We didn't like each other then. Went to Bible college. Came back to this church. Married my wife here. So God used my mother and still is. God used my wife as an anchor. Because sometimes I have a tendency to drift. And my wife keeps me where I need to be. And then my daughters. They're all mothers now themselves and God has used them in my life to help me and say, Daddy, that's not right. And then Michael's mother, we love you. We thank God for your son. Through all the hardships that these women have dealt with, all the, all the backstabbing that my mom took, that my wife took 
that my daughters took. They endured. God blessed them and they endured. And it's our mothers, our wives, our daughters that I meant it. They, we, guys, we're the leadership of the church. They are the heartbeat and the life of a church. Can I hear God's people say amen? Let's go back to Proverbs chapter 1. I'm just going to run through some things very quickly. Uh, when I put this together, I wasn't sure how I was going to preach it. God always helps me at the last minute. As you probably remember, several years ago, we were going through an issue in this church, and it was with women. Um... Some rebellious women, and uh, this is somewhere around 2005, 2006, something like that, before most of you were here. And I just, I mean, I didn't know what was going on, and God said, Mike, read Proverbs. I read it. I finished it. I said, okay, big deal. God said, read it again. I read it again. Then I read it. God said, read it again. And then I started to see. The outlines, I started to see the character of two separate women in the, in the book of Proverbs. There's the strange woman. I'm not going to deal with her this morning. I'm just going to focus on this virtuous woman. And I want you to notice in Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7, the Bible says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now, De now Solomon is writing this to his son. This is a father's words to his son. He's passing down the wisdom that God has given him. And here's what he says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. And woe be to any child, son or daughter. Your mother, your father, they have made mistakes in life. They have been burned by this world. They have gone out and chased the sinful things of this world and found out that it left them empty and, and with nothing left, ready to die, sometimes ready to even take their own lives. And they know more than you think they know about you and about what you do. Even when you do it behind their back, they still, mama still know, don't they, mama? Oh, yeah. So he said, my son, hear the instruction of thy father. Your dad will teach you how to change the oil and the spark plugs. But mom, and forsake not the law of thy mother. It's the dad who chose the children how to do this. But it's the mom who lays down the law. And it's the mom who looks at you and says, you are not leaving this house dressed like that. Amen. Amen. Who are you on the phone with now? Well, get off of it. Let, in fact, let me see your... This is mama. Let me see your phone. If my mom said that to me, I would unplug it from the wall and bring in this big black dial phone. And say, Here's my phone, mom. What do you want to see? That was the good old days, wasn't it? He said, Forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace under thy head and chains about thy neck. God wants to adorn you young people. Not with the vain things of this world that pass away. But see, the reason I had you people stand up and talk about your mother. None of you talked about how wealthy your mother was. None of you talked about how your mother used to wear gold and silver and, and jewelry and how you always wanted your mom to hand that down to you so you could wear it. None of you said anything like that. Everybody in this church testified of the character of their mother, not the possessions of their mother. That's more important. Amen. They shall be an ornament of grace under thy head and chains about thy neck. Now turn over to chapter 2. And I want you to notice something. God is going to characterize wisdom 
as a mother. Wisdom as a woman. I remember years ago, I was seeking different avenues of ministry and we traveled out to Topeka, Kansas to meet a man who had a ministry platform. We was trying to you know, promote the things that we do and I, he took his hand out, shook my hand. I said, hi, how you doing? And I'm trying to be nice to him. He's nice to me. And he said, hello to my wife. My wife shook his hand and he showed us around and we walked out of there and my wife said, I don't like him. And I went, oh, now, don't, don't do that. She was right. The guy cheated me. She had wisdom that I didn't have. And one of the greatest things that God ever did with me, in fact, one of the best things that God did in our marriage was the day that God used my wife to convict my heart about listening to my wife. Listening to her. She's got something to say. And you know what? She just might be right. My son, if thou, look at verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding. Now notice verse 4. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to characterize this as a mother. As a woman, a wife, a mother, a daughter. My daughters have counseled me. Dad, maybe we ought to do this. Dad, maybe we ought not be involved in that. If thou seekest, what's that word? Her as silver. Her as silver. And searchest for her as for hid treasures. Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord. How, how many people would raise their hand and say, My mother taught me the fear of God. You see, my dad never whipped me. Not one time did he ever lay a hand on me. It was my mother who said, give me your belt after I came home with that report card. After I broke the neighbor's car window. After I burnt my friend's tree house down. I had to wait all day long for that whipping. If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. And since he said the word her, guess whose mouth God is going to give that through? He's going to give it through our wives. He's going to give it through our mothers. He's going to give it through our daughters. Somebody say amen. Proverbs chapter 6. Turn there. You know, how, you know how everybody says the Bible's stupid and it's not right. And the Bible was written by men and those men didn't know anything. And I'm not going to read the Bible because it's just full of nonsense. And they didn't know anything back then. Who in here has ever picked up an ant and looked at it to see if it was male or female? Now, Bub, I believe you picked up a lot of ants. I doubt that you've ever noticed if it was a girl or a boy. Did you know that nobody knew that 
the head of the ant colony was a queen until they started looking at them through microscopes and they figured out the difference between male and female ants. And look at what Solomon said 3,000 years ago. Go to the ant thou sluggard, consider what? Her ways. See, God knew that before everybody else did, didn't he? And be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. The greatest lesson that any young person can ever learn is that when you finally grow up, Nobody is going to make you do anything. If you want it, you're going to have to get up out of bed and go to work and earn it yourself. Somebody say amen. You're going to have to not have somebody tell you to get up, tell you how to dress, tell you to make your bed, tell you to clean your toilet, tell you to wash your clothes, tell you to take a bath. You grow up one day because your mama taught you, I'm not doing it for you anymore. You do it for yourself. You see, nobody has to tell the woman what needs to be done. She just jumps in there and starts doing it. Having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. And we've got a system of government right now that just wants to dole out money. Give out money. Give money to everybody. And nobody has to work for it. That doesn't teach anybody anything. In fact, I think that's the wrong way to go, don't you? If our mothers taught us anything, it was... Nobody's going to do it but you. And if you want it done, do it yourself. Now, Proverbs 6.20. My son, keep thy father's commandment. Forsake, hear it again. Forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thy heart and tie them about thy neck. Not just have them in your mind. Not just memorize them. But put them in your heart. And when you put them in your heart, that way you'll put them into action. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. When, when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. If your mother has done the, the right job on you, you won't have to have her tell you what to do when you're 20, when you're 25, when you're 30, when you're 40, when you're 50 years old. You just automatically do it. I remember when we first moved up here, we, actually we moved down from Telegraph and dad bought a mobile home down here by Hematite. We moved in down there and they were going to build some rooms there on the back. So my uncle came up from Arkansas. My grandpa and grandma came up from Arkansas to help dad build these two rooms. And I remember one time I went in the bathroom of that trailer that we bought. And I used the bathroom. And on the way out, very foolishly, I'm only five years old, I locked the door and shut it on my way out. And there wasn't no key to that bathroom. And all of a sudden, my grandpa's got to go to the bathroom. He's got to go bad. And they lock, can't get the door open. Door's locked. I don't remember what all they... You remember that, Mom? I remember every bit of it. I don't remember what all they had to do. I think they had to tear the house down to get the bathroom door open. But I remember my mom was saying, Don't you ever lock that bathroom door again. It took me until I was 30 before I locked the bathroom door. That stuck in me. I'm not kidding you. That stuck in me because it was the law of my mother. And I'm telling you, moms, what you instilled in your children, I guarantee you some of it's still there. When thou awakest, it shall talk with thee, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. You're never going to be a place in life where nobody's telling you what to do anymore. 
And if your mama did a good job, the things that she taught you, you will hear in your mind for the rest of your life and it will guide your behavior. Now, I'm almost done. Turn to Proverbs 8. Oh, let's see here. Actually, Proverbs 9. If you read Proverbs 8, it's about wisdom, and wisdom is a woman. Proverbs 9. This is what I wanted to get to. Wisdom hath builded her house. Now again, the men can frame the walls, run the electric, put in the plumbing, set the toilet down, put the shower in, hang the drywall, paint the doors, paint the walls. We can do all of those things, but that's just, that's just the building of the house. The house is the mama, the husband, if he's there. And the children. I told you this a while back. I, I met a fella up at Sam's. I, he had a military cap on. He was a black man. had a military cap on. And this was during COVID. And, and so I just kind of walked up to him. I said, I usually shake hands. I said, but sir, I said, I just want to tell you, I appreciate you serving your country. And he looked at me with that military cap on, said Vietnam on it. And he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, I grew up in a single parent household with about 11 other children other than me. And he said, we had nothing. We had never been anywhere. I hadn't even hardly been anywhere too far outside of my house. And he said, I joined this nation's uh, uh, armed services. Can't remember what party he was in. He said, I joined the armed services of this country. And he said, here this poor little boy from down south from a, from a, a, a single parent home. I get to see the entire world. He said, I feel like a king. And I wanted to, oh, I was bald and I wanted to hug him, but it was COVID. You know, you can't do that. You see, his mother's raising him the way she did taught him to love his country and not hate it. Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her, notice this, seven pillars. What are those seven pillars? Anybody want to take a guess? Isaiah 11. Turn there. The seven pillars of the house that a godly woman builds are the seven spirits of God. So all of you grandmas, all of you great grandmas, all of you mothers, all of you young ladies who are not mothers yet, I want you to listen to this. My mom You see I, I knew my mom and I knew that even after she got saved she still struggled with old sins but she stayed in church and she turned them over to God every time so when I became an adult I struggled with my sins and my mom taught me you stay in church and you give them to the Lord. My wife, 
She struggled with sins. But her mama told her, you stay in church. And give them to the Lord. And all of my children have struggled with sins as an adult. But they saw their mama and their grandmas stay in church and give them to the Lord. That's that seven pillars. Isaiah 11, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And, and these seven pillars, if, if you, ladies, if you'll build that house, the devil cannot knock it down. The spirit of the Lord is the first pillar. There is one ruler in a house and his name is the Lord. Second pillar, the spirit of wisdom. Your mama, even though she can't program the DVR, she's got a wisdom that us men, Dave, ain't got. Amen? The spirit of understanding. When the kids get in trouble and they're too scared to go to dad, they go to mom. Because mom's got the spirit of understanding. And mom will say, you know that was wrong. But I understand. And then the spirit of counsel. Mom, what should I do? Mom, my husband's going to leave me. Mom, what should I do? Mom, my husband's messing around. What should I do? They go to mom for counsel. The spirit of might. Because like Megan said of her mom, don't mess with that she-bear. Amen? She's got might. And the spirit of knowledge. Because a woman has been around every block more than once. And she knows what's out there. And she knows what's good. And she knows what's not good. And like we mentioned a while ago, the fear of the Lord. Like I said, it, it wasn't my dad that ever whipped me. It was my mom. And she didn't just go, don't do that no more. My mom was a syllable whipper. I told you not to do that. You never do that again. Do you hear me? Am I right? I'm right. The syllable whipper. Listen. And I'm going to say this and I'm going to let you all go. The worst trouble I ever got myself in. God reminded me. Of what my mom taught me. Mike. You better be afraid of me. Because all those whippings you got when you were a boy. Is nothing compared to what I'm going to do to you. If you don't listen to me. God used my mother, my wife, her mom, my daughters, Michael's mom, you ladies. God is building this house 
And the heartbeat of this house is the seven pillars that God has put in the women in this church. Let me hear some men say amen. Let's bow our heads. Ladies, you could always use a little bit more of this. You cry out to God for wisdom. You cry out to God for to give you help to raise your children. This is a very, very bad, very bad world. There's somebody, there's somebody, listen, I guarantee if you've got young children in this world right now, there is some pervert, male or female, looking at your kids right now. Guarantee you. Now it's time for mamas to be more vigilant than they ever have been. Father, we come before you today. Lord, I thank you, dear God, for the blessing of motherhood. I thank you, dear God, for the blessing of my mother, who in this very church decided she was going to live for you and serve you. And in this very church, Lord, my wife decided she was going to live for you and serve you. And in this church, my daughters decided they were going to live for you and serve you. And I thank you, Lord, for all the things, all the testimonies we heard today. I thank you, God, for the women of this church. The heartbeat, the very soul of our church is in our ladies. The beauty of our church is in them. The wisdom, Father. Lord, you know how many times us men would get together to settle some serious issue about our church. But it was always our wives counseling us before the meeting. Father, there is no doubt whatsoever that the real strength in this church has been our dear sweet ladies. They're the ones who are standing. They're the ones who will keep standing when some of us men buckle and fall. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would bless them and give them crowns of glory. Adorn them, Father, with jewels of righteousness that the world may see in them and in this church the seven pillars that this house is truly built upon. And it exists in the lives and the hearts of all of our ladies. Father, we think of Sister Waymeyer. We think of Sister Bernice and many others, Lord, who have graced the floor of this church with their wisdom, with their beauty, with their knowledge. Keeping us in the old paths. And Father, as a new generation of young ladies grows up in this church, Father, may they follow in that same old path. Bless your word this morning. Bless this church. Bless these, our wonderful ladies, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Would you stand to your feet?